this morning on this uh, sunny, bright uh, February day. It's good to see the sun is and after all we've been through weather-wise and all the other things that have gone on, the sickness and things. Still got a lot of folks sick, as you can tell, as you look around, a lot of folks sick. And I just wanted to mention, too, um, Ruth Trent uh, is in a rehabilitation hospital in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And she's had a stroke, it's affected her leg. And uh, it's been mentioned that she'd like to have some cards from people. So I'm going to post this address out on the out on the bulletin board if you'd like to write it down. I'll take the time to read it at the moment. But if you'd like to write that down and send a card um, and uh, well wishes there, we greatly appreciate it. I know she would too at this time. And uh, she's able to talk effectively, uh, at least uh, seemingly. And so let's uh, keep her in our, in our prayers and our thoughts uh, throughout this day and, and the time to come. We've still got a lot of folks going through a lot of different things as you look around and you see today. As I said, let's, let's remember them in our prayers and all the things that are going on. Um, we were here Sunday night and Betsy mentioned that the whole row right through there has been decimated on both sides. So um, with, with sickness and things going on. So let's continue to pray. We do have some things to look forward to, and uh, we're looking forward to that here uh, in the days to come. This is Missions Month. I haven't got it fully decorated yet, but this is Missions Month, and we're going to be emphasizing we have two missionaries come in, one next week, and the families here Sunday morning, Sunday night, uh, both services here along the way, and uh, hopefully we can get back to a sense of normalcy in some respects along the way. Well, let's open up our service today, the word of prayer, and uh, let's get our minds set. And again, we're glad to have uh, a couple of folks uh, we haven't seen for a little while here with us, and who are busy probably too. Uh, if, you, if you're busy for the first time to Lighthouse Baptist Church, would you raise your hand? Okay. We're going to have you sing a special here in a moment. <laughs> uh, we're glad that you're here. We do, we want to get a record of that. Okay. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer if we could today. And uh, I'm going to ask John Palmer to pray for us.
history, that's just a little bit there. Um, I've been thinking about how to do all this today, and I think that we're going to, I really would rather do it at the end of the service, but uh, we're going to unveil this, this uh, window back here at, at this time. To do so, first of all, though, we're going to let you come and, and uh, give your offerings to the Lord. Um, one of these days, we're going to be uh, switching things back around a little bit the way we do some things. I don't know, we'll change everything that we've had to do through COVID, but we're going to make some changes. One is, I want us to go back to greeting big folks and so forth. I want to do that right away, but we hope to do that and get back to some things of normalcy there. Uh, what I'd like for you to do is to come give your offering at this time, and then if you can kind of all gather around uh, the edge of the pews to the center aisle uh, to back there, and uh, just give it up for a complete, let's try not to get back on the tiled area and uh, so that people can see, all right, so you're not blocking anybody's vision the best you can. And uh, we're going to reveal that here in just a moment, uh, an opportunity there. And I just want to thank some of the ladies. This was their idea. And uh, then it got passed on. Eventually, I, I kind of did the finishing work to it. But uh, we appreciate all those that had a part of that. And it still amazes me, you know, without letting you know it was even going to happen. We took an offering and over uh, around $2,200 came in. If you didn't have a chance to give to that, because it will be a little bit more than $2,200, if you'd like to give towards that, we'd appreciate it. Uh, but anyway, it's a tribute to her. This is something that Tina always wanted, uh, wanted and, you know, she just loves stained glass windows. In fact, our shed out here has some windows in it. She was hoping to turn them into stained glass windows at one time. And she's always wanted that. And it just worked out. We were a little concerned about putting uh, a hole through the wall and doing it that way. Uh, but I think you'll like the approach that came there and uh, a tribute to her. Friday was a year since she passed away. And um, we just, um, you know, of course, a sad day, but Lord got us through it, and uh, we just appreciate all the support and the help that's come that way. All right, so if you could come, give your offering, and then come and get it. Everybody see pretty good? It's not all, this is the good part. <laughs> you can make it 10% or anywhere in between. Here's 50%, here's 100%, and then you can get it to different cues. So it'll be open, everybody can see it, but it says in loving memory of Tina Marie Freeman, pastor's wife from 1985 to 2021. So let's, uh, I think it'd be good just to pray for just a moment. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all the people uh, who helped through the years and some have uh, passed away. But God, we ask you, Father, that God, that this might just be a tribute of all of our memories and thoughts and uh, we just thank you Lord for what you've done and the goodness of God's people and the memories that flood our soul. Lord we love you and praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Good our hymnals. Let's go ahead and stand and turn to page 277. Jesus loves even me.
I want you to take your Bibles today to the Gospel of Matthew. This is a great commission. We're going to stand and read it for probably the 20th or more time since I've been pastoring here. But let's stand, if you will, for the Gospel of Matthew. This is found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's also found in the book of Acts. Worded differently, but basically the same crux of the same message. So we look here in Matthew chapter number 28. And the Bible says in verse number 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now as we look at this verse, I want you to notice two words out of that great commission today. The word go and the word love. And we very seldom emphasize the second part. Word to go and word to, we see the word love, L-O. So we're going to look at that here in just a minute. And I want to preach on basically the love of the gospel. You may be seated. Some people come to know Jesus Christ through reading a gospel track. Some come to know the Lord through just reading the scriptures themselves or a plan of salvation in the back of the Bible somewhere leads them to Christ. Dozens of stories, wonderful truth and testimony to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has come as a result of that. But most people respond to the gospel because somebody told them about Jesus Christ. Somebody came to them or somebody or they went to someone else and they opened up the door and showed them the way into eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nobody ever gets to heaven any other way but through Jesus Christ. We're pretty familiar with that fact this morning. But still God's promise or God's petition or God's mandate to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to go, to go and share the gospel with other people. We're not just going to sit here on these pews and expect the auditorium to be filled up with converts and people and disciples of the Lord Jesus. It takes human effort and toil and labor and prayers in order that people might see to the respond to the gospel. It goes with me, it goes with you, and it goes with everybody that names the name of Christ. This is a commission given to the church. If you're part of the church, you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been Baptized and want to follow the Lord. That's all part of it, although salvation is in Christ alone. We're to go with that message to all the world. I heard it when I was a little boy growing up in church. Untold millions are still untold. And with all the billions of people that live on planet Earth today, there's still many of them have never heard the message of Jesus Christ. Even here in America, I believe there are people, maybe they've heard the name of Jesus. Maybe they've heard somebody talk about it. Maybe they've even passed by on the TV and heard somebody preach about him, some respects, but they've really never settled their minds to hear what the gospel says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to preach. That's part of it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That idea of teach is just present, to share Christ. We're to go, the Bible says here, to preach. We're to go and to baptize people. Even though baptism is not part of the gospel, it's part of the commission to go and to let others know their need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. By the way, in some places of the world today, if you make a commitment to Jesus Christ and then uh, you seek to be baptized, you will actually be persecuted by government officials and others, and many of them will lose their life. That's a daily thing throughout the world. They need to be baptized. We see also the persecution, sometimes death, and sometimes families divorce them if they baptize or baptize. Because see, that's making and letting others know what's transpired in your heart when Jesus Christ saved you from your sin. I'm telling you, the part of the commission is to go. We can sit here and we can minimize things and say, not too many people are getting saved today and all the other excuses we want to live but God hasn't changed his mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But I want you to know as we do that and should do that in our life, 
whether we fail to do it or not, still there's a promise that goes with this here at the end in verse 20. I want you to look at this verse again, and then I want you to go to the book of Acts with me. We'll be there in a moment. It says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always unto the end of the world. I shared with my homiletics class in Bible College Monday night, there are four alls in this. In verse 19, we see teach all nations. Then the Bible says here, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I skipped one there somewhere, but there are four alls found in that passage of scripture. Oh, back to verse 18 is the other one. All power is given unto me. So as we see here, God's authority. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gives the orders of the commands for the church to move forward and to share the gospel with other people. And that ought to be what's on our hearts today. Not our personal problems, not our matters we're facing, but can people still hear about Jesus? Can we get the gospel to people who need to be saved and need to be born again? I think of that love. <coughs> He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I am with you. See that phrase, with you? In the Gospel of Matthew, we start out with the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the names that's tagged upon him is the term Emmanuel, which means God with us. It starts the book of Matthew, starts with the word with you, and it ends here with this thought, lo, I'm with you all the way into the end of the world. The same presence that Christ gave when he came into the world to be born is the same presence he walks with those and goes through with those who are willing to share and take the gospel unto the most parts of the earth. I'm not just talking about missionaries, dear friend. I'm talking about every born again believer has the opportunity to share Christ with somebody else. As a result of that, we see the word lo, with us, with us. What a statement that is. May I say there's three things that his presence does. And first of all, his very presence. Do you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is in you in the form of the Holy Spirit of God? He's not only with you, he guides you, he directs you, he wants to help you, he wants to empower you to do what you need to do. He empowers us. One of the verses, Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, says there, he goes before working and bringing and willingly working with them. In other words, he is with us as we share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So his presence, his power, his promise here we see as he leads us into all places. I heard about Henry Ironside who many years ago pastored the Moody Bible <coughs> Church in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, Henry Irons, I was just a young man at the time. And we started in, uh, not pastoring the church, but he started in doing a Bible study with some ladies of the church. Now, he was a young man. And he sat down with them and he taught them the Bible, the Word of God. And they were going through the book of Matthew. They were coming to the end and they read these verses. And he said to, them, said to that group, he says, listen, isn't it amazing that the Lord is willing to be with us even unto the end of the age or the end of the world? That end of the world means when Christ will hand over, uh, take over and begin to judge the world for now he initiates his grace to the heart of everybody that seeks to know Christ. Can I say I'm with you all the way even in the world? And he said that to those ladies. And one of them, he said, to them, what a great promise. This is. And one of the ladies spoke up and said, this is not a promise. This is a right. It's a right. And all, all of a sudden, the Lord here is showing us and telling us that he'll be with us even to the end of the world. I want you to go, if you will, for just a moment to the book of Acts. We'll be there in just a moment. Turn over to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18 in the Word of God. And please follow with me because... We're going to look at a few verses here in the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 18. You know, folks, we've made this so complicated when it's really so simple that half the people are afraid and scared to death to even open their mouth and say something about Jesus. 
But anybody, we can talk about the Lord, we can talk about our circumstances, we can talk about the things that we're going through. We were at a restaurant the other night. And we were sitting there. There was Adam and Mary Ann sitting across. I was sitting on the other side of the bench. And we were sitting there. We were getting ready to order. And the waitress comes up. And all of a sudden that waitress come up to the table. And I don't know what spurned him to do it or what spurned him to say it. But he said to that young lady that was waiting on us, he says, you know, he said, uh, and he just blurted it out. He says, my grandmother died. And uh, that lady kind of looked at him a little bit. And it wasn't long. They held a little bit of a conversation. And she said back to him, you know, uh, my, my father had just died. And the tears started coming down her face. And what he didn't know is he opened the door for somebody to reach into the heart of that young lady and talk to her. We shared a, a good several minutes even before we ordered our food talking with her. She told us a little bit more of the story, what was going on, the happenings that surrounded all of that. And later on, I was able to paste a gospel track in her hand and tell her, you need to read this. And she says, I will. I don't know the complete story or what's going to happen, whether she, her heart was reached or not, but I can tell you this. It doesn't take anybody. It can take, God can use almost anybody. If, if God can take a donkey in the Old Testament and make it speak, hey, listen, he can take any of us and make us available and willing if we'll just open our mouths and go. But I'm thankful with that go today is a low. He's with us. He's guiding us. He's directing us. His presence is there. His power is there. His ability is there to accomplish what needs done. Now, the Apostle Paul had been out and shared the gospel in what was called Asia Minor. And he started several churches preaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus. But then they came back in Acts chapter 15. There was a dispute that occurred over whether people who were converted need to be circumcised. It was a Jewish rite. These were Gentile people. The Apostle Paul stood up and others did and said, we don't think this is needful and necessary. And as a result, the vote was taken. It was determined this was the will of God. And so Paul headed out on the second missionary journey. When he packed his bags and he headed to the town of Philippi, he was immediately presented by people who were in opposition to him. He was there. Stripes were laid upon him as he was thrown into that Philippian jail. He was faced all kinds of torture. A demoniac girl had been relieved of the depression that she had been in and all the other things that took place there. But through all the good, there was the bad, the stripes, the imprisonments. Immediately, he left town and left Philippi. He went to Berea, but he was assaulted there. And at Thessalonica, he could only spend three weeks there because they sought to exterminate Paul and get rid of him. But enough of the gospel was left that a church sprung up. We see what took place in the meantime. We also see that through all of this, the insults and humiliation that Paul had when he went to the city of Athens, that Greek city where all the intelligentsia of the world lived at that day. And when they were there, they called him an old hayseed, basically, a seed picker. Here's the Apostle Paul had probably more education and training they did. But because he was preaching something inferior, the gospel of Jesus Christ, inferior to their minds, we see that they just ignored him. They humiliated him, made a public show. And very few people responded to the gospel there. From there, he went to Corinth. He was blasphemed and made fun of. But when we turn to Acts chapter 18, I want you to see this. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 9 and 10, the Bible says here, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Remember what he said to the disciples? Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. He says here in a night vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. In other words, Paul let it rip. I'm with you. And can I say today, regardless of what goes on around us, the circumstances that we bear, if we are willing to share Jesus and we're willing to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
It's amazing what God does and how he goes with us. I think also after that, he went on to a third missionary journey. When he finished with that, starting churches in Ephesus and other places there in the world, into Europe and other places, we see that finally he determined, I must go to Jerusalem. I've got to go back to my roots here for a moment. And he was determined even to leave a little early in order to get back there when he got to Jerusalem. As soon as he got to Jerusalem, he had with him Timothy and Titus, some of the entourage of men who followed Paul. And he goes back, he goes back into the temple area and a riot breaks out. Well, who is this that you brought in, this Gentile that you brought into the temple? It wasn't long that the guards came and took Paul and asked him, but there was so much commotion, they took him up onto the steps, entering into the fortress, and as they did, Paul turned around and tried to give a defense as to what had happened, but they were really trying to pull him apart. Then they put him and brought him before the Sanhedrin, the political body and religious body of the nation of Israel. And Paul gave his defense unto them. But he knew they were at odds. He knew that part of them were Sadducees and part of them were Pharisees. And they never got along. And he mentioned about one who rose from the dead. And one of them believed him. The other group wouldn't. And again they started and put him back in jail. Not knowing what to do with this man. Also not really he, uh, fully understanding that he was a citizen of the Roman Empire. This great apostle Paul, this man of God, set out out of Jerusalem, and he came, and all of a sudden, word got word that they were going to, to assault him, and they were going to hijack him and take him away from this, this journal of people. As a result of that, apostle Paul was taken and brought out of the city and was taken and rushed with over 276 armed guards just to get him from out of Jerusalem into the city of Caesarea where he would later stand trial before him. Three of the most important religious figures and three of the most political figures of all of the area of Israel and the Jews. With that in mind, turn over with me to the book of Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. Look with me in verse 11. He's brought to a passing. The Bible says in verse 11, the night following the Lord stood by me. I don't know about you, but have you ever sensed God's presence so real in your life? It was like he was standing right there next to you. That maybe he even put his arm around you. Well, let's look on. I don't know exactly the story, but the Bible says, And the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified with me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also in Rome. I'm not finished with you yet. By the way, when the Apostle Paul was called into the ministry, the, the testimony that God gave to him was that through all that you're going to go through, through all that you're going to experience in your life, he says, I want you to know that you're going to suffer great things for my name's sake. Paul knew that suffering lay in his road. But what he didn't always realize is that the Lord was going to be with him every step of the way. See, when he went to Jerusalem, he was determined to go. But there was a great crowd of good people that loved the Lord that said, Paul, you shouldn't go to Jerusalem. You don't know what's ahead of you up there if you go back home. But Paul went anyway. It's all of that because of God's presence watching over him and caring for him through this ordeal. But there's another happening. This Apostle Paul eventually is released. He goes back and makes his plea to the people. And he says, listen, I must go to Rome. I appeal to Caesar. You're not going to settle this dispute that took place in Jerusalem. I'm going to go to the head of all the Roman Empire. And I'm going to stand before Caesar and I'm going to plead my case. I'm a Roman citizen. I have my rights. And so they put him on board a ship at a time of the year when sailing was not commodious. And he got on board that ship and headed out. And eventually, they ended up, a storm came. A mighty east wind from called Eurachlan and began to rock that boat. 
And for two solid weeks they could not eat as they threw the grain and other things out of the ship. Those winds began to beat against that soap. They tied rips, uh, ropes around that ship so that it would be held together. And eventually they hit, hit shore and it busted the ship in pieces. But you know something? Again, over 270 people were on board that ship. And the Bible gives us the indication not a one of them would lose their life. If you look in Acts chapter 27 in the Bible, you look there with me in Acts chapter 27 now and verse 23. See, there's the go, but don't forget the low. Low, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. In Acts chapter 27, verse 23. Acts chapter 27, verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whom I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that will sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it should be even it was told me. While that ship was coming come unglued and people were losing nerve and fearful of what might transpire, they might lose their life. Paul said, God stood by me and told me everything's going to be wrong. All are going to be saved. Not just my life, but everybody's life's going to be saved. That's the presence and the promise of God. He takes care of those who lose out. Now Paul's reached the end of his life. He's put in a jail called the Mamertine Prison in Rome. They say that no one ever escaped from that prison. And there was Paul. <coughs> there was the refuge flowing through there like a sewer through the prison. I saw that uh, in the Philippines in a prison there. One of the most disgusting things you'll ever see in your life. Paul is there, and as he looks down, he sees all the waste going through. And they say more people died in that prison from rats than from anything else. And Paul was there. He was alone. Nobody else was with him. And while he was there, all of a sudden, he says, could you bring John Mark with me? A man who had failed Paul earlier in his life, could you bring him with me? the parchments so that I can read. And he goes on to say, he says, no man stood with me. I was alone. No one was there with me. But he makes this statement. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That by me the preaching might be fully known that all Gentiles might hear that I'm delivered out of the mouth of the lion. A few hours later, Paul will be taken and his head severed from his body. But guess what? God's still with him. He's in glory. He's in heaven. Some people say, preacher, I couldn't do this. Well, maybe you're not called to be a missionary, to plant churches and do all of that, but I do believe we all have a part to share the gospel. When you say, I can't do this, what did Paul said? I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. We can go through things. We don't understand sometimes the complexities of things that happen. We look at things today and we don't see the gospel as, gospel as prosperous as it once was. But God's, God's right is still there. Lo, I am with you all. And you wonder why you don't feel as close to God as you ought to? Because we're not maybe involved pushing out with the gospel of Jesus Christ like we need to. Listen, folks, I, I know what it's like humanly, especially you that are mothers, but you have to let your children go. And they go and say, I'm going to marry a preacher, and then God calls them to a mission field somewhere. Your heart beats for them. Well, think of the danger that they'll face. Will I ever see my grandkids again? All those things that you go through and you wonder about, can that ever happen? Can, can I handle that? Can I, I go through all of that? Can I say, if the Lord's with you, you can go through things in other places that you may not be able to handle here. 
You know, the same things on a mission field. And I know there's some places that are more intense and more judgmental. I know we love each other, but listen, when it comes down to it, the greatest right that we have as a Christian is that God, lo, I'm with you always. Lo, I'm with you always. Even under the end of the world, God will watch over us. I've shared this story before. But there was a missionary couple back over 100 years ago in 1921. And they were Swedish. And they left the land of Sweden. Sway was her name. David was his name. Their last name was called Flood. And they decided they were going to the Belgian Congo. Today it's called Zaire. And they left. And their mission board had a mission headquarters there in that area. They met up with a young couple by the name of the Ericsons. And there, the floods of the arrogant Ericsons set out to take the gospel to a little, little tribe of people, several hundred people. But they couldn't make inroads. The chief wouldn't let them place their hut there. They weren't allowed to stay or reside there. They were treated with basically disrespect and basically, we don't want you around, we don't trust you. You white people, we just don't know about you. And as a result of that, Sway and Dan and the Ericsons set up a little hut on the outskirts and they had no contact with those people. They didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to hear them. And finally, from this, there was a young boy who sold chickens and eggs, came by and knocked on their door one day. He was from that tribe of people. And he came and he sold them some eggs and, and uh, some chickens to raise. And as a result of that, they built up a little bit of a friendship. And Sway says, if I can't do anything, I'm going to lead that young boy to the Lord. And she did. She told him about Christ. A little while later, Sway became pregnant with a child. Her husband was getting malaria and then eventually it was passed on to her the baby was born but 17 days after that baby was born Sway died they put up a little cemetery there a little, little plot with a marker on it that said Sway Flood but all of a sudden David said I can't raise this kid the Ericsons had already headed back to the mission headquarters. They said, we can't stay here. It's just impossible to reach these people. And David took that baby and handed it over to the Ericsons and says, I can't raise her either. In fact, I'm going back to, back to Sweden. And so he did. Later on, the Ericsons got malaria. And both of them died. And before this was over, they had made sure that the mission agency got care of that little girl. They changed her name to Aggie, and she came to the States and lived in the Dakotas. While in the Dakotas, she began to grow up and attended a church, was saved, even went to Bible college. And one day, out of the blue, a magazine from Sweden came and was placed in her mailbox. The magazine was written in Swedish. She, she didn't know it. She didn't know one word of Swedish. She took it to someone who did. And it was an article, and it had her mom's gravesite. It raised her curiosity. She knew she had a dad. And she actually traveled to Sweden to find him. David was so bitter on God, what God had done for him, he just turned his back on him. He says, I don't want the name of God ever mentioned in my house again. Not only that, he turned to alcohol and other things to bring comfort to his anger. 
As a result of all of that, Sway visited her dad one day. She heard all of that. Said, but dad, there's a marker of mom over there. And I'm going to go investigate. Say, God didn't mean to do this to hurt you. And before the end of the day was over, she stayed almost all day. Finally, he recommitted himself to the Lord. But she made her way back to the Congo. And when she got back to the Congo, she met this crowd of people. They were all worshiping together. How did this all happen? All of a sudden, she turned to a young man now, probably in his 20s and 30s. He says, who are you? He says, I'm the, I'm the young boy. But your mother led me to the Lord. And I started telling others in our tribe about Jesus. And it wasn't long until people were getting saved and the chief even got saved. And now there's over 600 of us that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. From all of this, looked around, she found his grave. She said, I want you to know that that grave is the most important spot in all of the common and that your mother is a hero. Listen, folks, when God says go, he says hello. He'll take care of it. And when God sends his missionaries out, he'll take care of it. It doesn't mean that they're not going to go through tragedies, they're not going to go through heartaches, they're not going to face death, they're not going to face persecution. It just means the Lord's with them. And the Lord's presence is there. And if we want the Lord's presence in our life, we need to do the same. I just thought of this this morning. Many years ago, when we were in our old building, there was a young couple. I'm not even sure they were married at the time, but they were, they were coming to church. And I remember the young lady got saved. But after about two, maybe three months, after just a short period of time, then they just felt like they needed to move out of the area and go. We never really got to disciple them or do anything much with them. And it was probably 10 to 12 years later, we opened the mail one day and inside was a letter from that young lady. She says, I just want you to know how much you influenced our life. She said, I'm singing in the choir, and she named the church. She says, I'm, I'm, I'm living for the Lord, and God's done some gracious things and good things for us and manifested himself to us in different ways, and she went through the letter telling of all the good things we've done. Little do we know what, what impressions, what happens when things, when the gospel is shared, when the word of God is given, how it can come back to reap benefits in the days to come. Say, lo, I'm with you always, even in the end of the world. So we talk about missions this month. Just remember, there's a God in heaven who says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. One of the last words he has said before he sent it back up into heaven. But he also said, lo, I'm with you always, even in the end of the world. Through all the political unrest, through all the COVID, through all the things we face, just let it be known today that, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. God does not abandon this call. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Appreciate your attention this morning. Lo, I'm with you all day, even under the end of the world. Whether it be Paul, or Bob, or Bill, or Greg, or any other name.
name that we can come up with. Every lady. Any time we were able to speak up and say something about Jesus or place a track in somebody's hand of God, what God can do. It's amazing the stories that can be told. But we're not here just to form stories and testimonies. I want you to sense the real presence and power of God. So let's do what we can to get the gospel out by House Baptist Church. Let's all do our part. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, we come to you today asking God will help us to surrender, to do what we can, to do what we can do with you in us, Lord, with you directing our steps, with you embarking in our hearts to make this the greatest, greatest call and the greatest thing that you've chosen in life to take the gospel unto all the world. And you give us that part, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord. Help us to stand behind. I can do all things through Christ and strengthen me. Help us to see the value of a dollar, but also, Lord, help us to see the value of the gospel. In thy name we pray. Amen.